So, chapter 20. This is basically trying to take what we did in chapter 18 and 19 and sort of explain why it does what it's supposed to do. Okay, so chapter 18 and 19 is really talking about money. And chapter 19 is how we muck with the money supply. And the question is, so what? Right? Just because the Fed can swim around in big, huge swimming pools full of cash, how is that going to help the economy? Right? We're out. <laughs> <laughs> or, how does the Fed fix the economy? So a lot of people like to say that, well, when the Fed is buying up all of these securities, right, they're throwing money out into the system, they're just throwing money out there, and if people have more money, what do they do with it? They spend it, right? I mean, that, that's what happens when someone gives you money, is that you spend it, right? The, the, the problem here, though, is, is the Fed giving you guys money? No. I mean, who's, who's the Fed giving money to? Banks. Banks. Banks get to play with it. The banks get to, do, do banks actually spend money? I mean, if you give the bank an extra million dollars, are they going to, like, hire four or five people to take care of that million dollars? Mm. Doubtfully. Doubtfully, right? Because that million dollars, if they hired four or five people, would be gone in about a year or two because they'd have to pay their salaries. In which case, then, what would the bank have to do? Get another million. <laughs> they have to get another million to keep paying, right? They'd fire them, right? So obviously, it, it, it's not that the banks are giving us money and therefore we have money and we spend more of it, right? That's the simpleton's way of looking at how the Fed fixes the economy. Please do not tell me that on the test. It will piss me off. Okay? Cody, darn it. Do not tell me that when the Fed increases the money supply that we're all swimming in money so we spend more and therefore the economy recovers. You're smarter than that, all right? What does increasing money supply do? Well, if we have a money supply, guess what we need to have as well? Money demand. Man. Great idea. So the first thing we have to talk about is what? is the demand for money. In other words, why do we carry cash around in our wallet? Why do we leave money in our checking accounts or our savings accounts or in traveler's checks or in certificates of deposits that are less than $250,000 that are going to mature in less than a year? Because all of those things are money, right? <laughs> so the first thing is, yeah, right? Transactions demand. We need to buy stuff. I could have put in the appropriate S word there, but I'm feeling... Do they sometimes call it trade? The trade demand well, for money? Yeah, do they refer to it as trade? Uh, it's, it's not really what it's what it's going to be considered, but it's sort of, I, mean, I guess you kind of couldn't think of it that way, but it, it's really just, the reason we hold money is so that we can buy things, right? I mean, that, that's part right, of why we right. hold money, right? Now, why else do we have money sitting in our savings accounts or checking accounts? Pay bills. Pay bills, right? Or... precautionary demand. In other words, part of the reason why we keep some money in our savings account is that we know what's going to happen to the heater in our house. It's, it's going to break. break. What's going to happen to our car? It's going to break. It's going to break down. What are we going to need with our house? We're going to need a new roof. And so we need to have money sitting in an account somewhere that we can get so that we can buy these things or fix these things sometime in the near future, right? So money for rainy day purchases. So this is why we may keep two or three thousand dollars sitting in our savings account or checking account that's earning zero percent interest instead of investing it in the stock market where in theory it could earn up to fifteen percent 
probably more like six or seven or eight percent, but still, right? I mean, earning six percent versus earning nothing would be better if we had it there, but we need to hold on to that because we know this stuff is going to happen. Right? There's one more reason that we hold money. And that's for the speculative demand. So the idea behind this here is that we could put our money in the stock market, right? And when we invest our money in the stock market, we'd expect you know, a certain percentage increase, which is nice. But if we put all of our money in the stock market, what happens when, our, you know, when we're here at school and it turns out that somebody is going to start up a business and what they need is some capital investment in starting the business. And suppose that that business is like the ultimate idea. It's like the new, the new iPhone concept comes through, or the new iPad concept comes out, and it's developed here. And those people are saying, look, here's my idea. They pitch you your idea, and you're like, that would be an awesome thing to make. You need to start building those now. And those people, you know, but the problem is, is that they need money to start doing it. If you don't have any money, can you invest in this great idea? No. No. So part of what we do is we keep a little bit of our cash that hanging around so that we can find that sweet deal. And when it shows up, we can say, look, 10 grand, can I at least get in for 10 grand? And for every, you know, million dollars you make, you just give me another 10 grand come back, right? So you give them 10 grand and they make their first million in like three months. So they give you 10 grand back. You've already made your money back. What happens three months later? Another 10 grand. Another 10 grand. What happens another three months later? 20 grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, would you want to invest in a company that's going to double your money every three months? Yeah. Hell yeah. So that's why you keep a certain amount of money hanging around. Money for a sweet deal. Now, obviously, for you and I, for you and I, we, we probably don't have a whole lot of money in speculative demand, right? I mean, we're not so flush that we can just throw somebody $100,000 and invest in their company. But the big players out there, they do that. This is why there are those CDs that are short term, less than a year in maturity, and under a quarter of a million dollars. Because there are companies or people out there who have that kind of money who are looking for the sweet deal. And as soon as they see it, they're like, dump the CD, get their $200,000 back and say, great, you're going to start Microsoft 2? Here you go, Keanu, here's $200,000. Make me make me a million dollars in a year, right? Because that's why yeah, that's what the that's what you want. Your CD is only going to pay you about three or four percent. Keanu's going to double your money in a year. It's making like a hundred percent. That's obviously a little better, right? So these are the reasons why we keep money. Now the cool thing about it is, guess what kind of a graph it looks like? Gee, I wonder. <laughs> It's a demand curve. What should I draw? Oh, demand line. A good old demand line. <laughs> Let's call it monetary demand. Yeah, it's the demand for money, right? So it, our, we're working up here for money. So this is, the, is our quantity. It just represents money. M2. Money, the amount of money that we would hold, right? What normally goes on this axis? Price. Price. What does it cost us to hold money? Mm. What do we earn when we invest money? Interest. Interest rates, right? When we don't invest our money, the amount of money we're losing is the amount of money we could have earned in interest, right? So if we're walking around with a $20 bill in our pocket, we're pissing away interest every day. I mean, the interest is like one-tenth of a penny, but, I mean, we're still throwing it away. You shouldn't carry around cash ever, because you may need that one-tenth of a penny sometime in the future. <laughs> well, you got to have cash to begin with. <laughs> to really carry it around. So this is what the demand for money looks like. What does the supply of money look like? Now, remember, why is it straight up and down, Mark? Because it's... 
What did we just talk about in chapter 19? What does the Fed do? They, they, they keep pushing money into it so it's always available. And it, because it's so readily plentiful, it's straight up and down. You're on the right track anyways, but the reason that the supply is a straight up and down is because the Fed holds the money supply. They say, I want the money supply to be $25 trillion. Right. I mean, and they're measuring it, right? That's what right. the... That's what the Fed does every day, right. is it gets all of these banks' reports saying, how many deposits do you have, how many loans do you have, how much cash is there, what's the value of all of your checking accounts, savings accounts, and CDs of less than 250. Basically, they count it up every day. It usually always goes up, not down. <laughs> it usually goes up, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's sitting at like 32 trillion right now, I think. Is it at 30 some odd trillion yeah. right now? Okay, well, the key here is that what, what do we, what, what, where do supply and demand intersect? At the equilibrium. equilibrium. The equilibrium. This is the interest. Rate. This is our interest rates. But so, whose, whose interest rate is that? It's really the interest rate for the bank. The banks. Yeah, it's more along the lines of the banks. But it, it's more, it's really kind of what we're paying as well, because what we pay is always three to four percent more than this. But again, it's, it's an average interest rate kind of concept. And we always earn like five to ten percent less. Yeah. Really what this represents is the interest rate that the government is paying on treasuries and securities. That's really what most economists will say that this interest rate is. And that what we pay in interest on the loan is directly tied to this, but it's not the same number, right? Again, that's usually I remember back in the '80s, uh, you could get you could open a savings account for like nine percent interest. Oh yeah. Well, that's because the government was paying about seven and a half to eight percent interest on their on their thirty-year treasury notes, which is why the right now the Fed is is jumping around happy with all of the, the loans that it's making because. If you buy a 30-year treasury note right now, how much are they paying? 2%. 2 30 years ago was 1984. Guess what they were paying 30 years ago? 11.5%. Those are the ones that are finally ending, right? 30 years worth of interest at 18 frickin' percent or 12 percent, right? So as soon as those go off the books, as soon as the Fed pays those off, that interest rate disappears. Oh. The Fed is just dancing around a little bit, watching those disappear, going, yay, yay, yay. Right? Because now all this money is just cheap, cheap, cheap. Right? But the fact remains is that what has the Fed been doing over the last few years? Increasing the money supply. So let's assume that the Fed increased the money supply to $30 trillion, right? What's the result of the Fed increasing the money supply? Interest rate goes down. Do so they need to get the interest back up for savings and stuff? Yeah, but they don't want you saving. Come on. <clears throat> saving doesn't make new products get built. You need to spend more money, Mark. And it, it gets you more uh, speculative money to invest and... Cautionary money and all that. Yeah. I mean, who, who has that nowadays? No one. Well, they're, not, they're lucky to have what they can meet their bills with. True, true. There's some of that going on, but that's more of that's more of a condition of the economy than it is with the, the supply of money, right? The fact that people aren't getting, you know, that don't have jobs or they don't have jobs that are paying them what they should get paid or would like to get paid. That's an uh, that's an effect of the economy, not effect of how much money is available. Right? There's tons of money out there, right? There's Thirty-seven trillion dollars worth of money out in the system. Yeah, for those people that had it. Yeah. So I'm but saying, no, aren't they really, you know? Uh, again, though, again, the key to this is that what the money supply is adjusting is not how much money we have in our bank bank accounts. It has nothing to do with that. All it's adjusting is the interest rates that we're paying for loans or earning on interest. That's all it's really doing. Okay. That's what the money supply does. Now, the question here is, why does increasing the money supply lower interest rates? It lowers the value of the dollar. Increasing 
M2 will lower interest rates. We'll get well, to the value of the dollar. There's more bit. money available for the banks to borrow, so then... Since they have more money, what are they going to do to try and they lend it out? They don't need the money because they have more money, and so if they exactly. lower the interest rates, they're more luck reluctant to borrow the money at the low interest. More money in the system means banks have an easier time lending yeah, so interest ones. rates fall. Again, remember that the Fed doesn't give us money, it gives the money to the bank. Well, again, it doesn't give either. I, I, keep, I shouldn't say that word, right? Because the banks are not getting money. What they're doing is trading money, right? They're trading money for treasury notes and treasury securities, right? So what's happening right now is that banks are sitting on a lot more cash and a lot less government securities, treasury bills, and treasury notes, right? So a lot of their equity is held in loanable money. The problem with them is that right, even at interest rates of 1.5% and 2%, right? I mean, you can go buy a house right now and get a, a, a mortgage at like 4%, 4, 4.5%. Why aren't people going out there and buying new houses and getting a mortgage at 4%? Because the economy's not good enough shape for them to be able to afford it. And that's kind of what happened to begin with, because the banks had a lot of money they were wanting to. I mean, they, they wanted to lend people money. Sure they did. And they would pretty much, in desperation, give anybody oh, a loan. Sure. They were. They were giving anybody a loan back in 2008. And, and then so people couldn't pay those loans. That was the problem. So, and, so why is the bank having such a hard time lending out money right now? Because they got burned in 2008 lending money out freely to anybody who asked for it, right? Pretty much. Right? I mean, we could have gone to, any one of us could have gone to the bank and gotten a $100,000 loan five years ago. You didn't have to have a job, right? All you had to do was be 18. Well, some of you probably weren't even 18 five years ago. Darn kids. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think maybe not 100000 not enough, you know, no, no. Uh, security for a loan, but yeah, I mean, but it was it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty close. Easy yeah, to all you had to do is to say, well, I have my, ed I'm going to finish my education next semester, and I'm going to get a job. And the banks would have said, oh, you're going to get a job? Great! Here's a hundred thousand dollars account. Well, <laughs> yeah, true. However much you need to buy your house, right? Yeah. Maybe it was only fifty, sixty thousand. You were just getting a starter home, right? Of course, yeah. A lot of little two bedroom thing, and a, sort of a tucked away community. That's what you should do. Anyways, that's the idea behind it. Now, the other way that it works, a more book way of dealing with this, is to look at it from the security side of it, right? I like to look at it from the bank's perspective because, because then you can talk like a banker and you can be an asshole and it's, it's kind of fun. But the other way of looking at it is that when more money is in the system, we will demand more government securities. So all those treasury bills and treasury notes, when we have money, we need to invest it somewhere. And if we can't put it in a bank, we're going to invest it in the government, right? I mean, that, that, that's always a nice, safe investment, right? When we demand more government securities, what happens to the price of those securities? When we demand more of something, what happens to the price to it? Goes up, right? So they pay less interest on the bonds. Exactly. Price of the government securities, and of course you guys will spell all these words right, I won't will rise, and when the price goes up, that means that the amount of interest that they pay goes down, right? Higher price equals lower interest. And thus, the interest rate has fallen, right? 
And that's part of what's going on right now with the reason that interest rates are so low is that there is a high demand for our government securities. Why? It, they, it doesn't make sense because they're taking money out of the money supply that way, aren't they? No. Uh -uh. But again, remember that, that Treasury securities have nothing to do with the money supply, right? So whether those things oh, are paying yeah. interest or not, they, they have no effect on it, right? Okay. So the fact remains here is that the reason people are demanding so many securities, the main reason is because they're looking for safety, right? Everyone's assuming that the federal government, the U.S. federal government is a safe investment. If you give the government money, they will pay you back. If you give that money to a bank like J.P. Morgan or Chase, Manhattan Bank, are you guaranteed to get your money back anymore? No. No, right? Remember Lehman Brothers? Lehman Brothers was one of the biggest banks, third biggest bank in the world. They folded in 2008, folks. Everybody who had money invested in them lost it all. Bye bye. Right? That's why Kevin Bacon is making movies again. He had all of his money invested in Lehman Brothers, right? He got caught in the Ponzi scheme. He lost about. He just, $450 million. So what's he doing? Getting his ass back to work. <laughs> All right, so these are the two arguments for why more money means lower interest rates. This is a more traditional argument. This is what you'll read in the book. This is how the book explains why it happens. But realize this is another offshoot of, of what's going on. All right? Now, So just let me make another note, just again to be safe. I like to point this out, right? So note. <clears throat> As the price of securities rises, interest rates fall. moving in opposite directions. So if, as we suspected is going to happen, at some time in the near future, the Fed says, okay, the money supply is too big. We need to lower it. <laughs> so the Fed says, okay, $30 trillion, that's too much. Let's lower it to say $28 trillion. When the Fed reduces the money supply, what happens to interest rates? Goes up. Interest rates will go back up to like 1.75%. What will happen to the price of bonds, of securities? Go down. When the interest rates go up, prices go down. Because when you buy a bond, remember that you, the amount you pay, the price you pay, is always the value of the bond minus however much interest you're, you're earning. So if you're earning more interest, the price is less. All right. So just realize that interest rates and the bond market move in opposite directions. All right. This is important if you are going to do any kind of investing and you want to have your investment portfolio potentially include the bond market. Right. Back in 2009, I took about 25% of my 401k and told my investment advisor put it in the bond market. Between 2009 and 2014, interest rates have been constantly falling. What has happened to the price of all the bonds I've been purchasing? I've seen an 18% return on my bond market investments since 2009. Because it's just a direct relationship, folks. Now, now that interest rates are as low as they can go, they can't hardly get any lower. Guess what I've been doing with all of my money in the bond market? Selling. Selling. Hell yeah. I <laughs> get my ass out of there, baby. Right? Because once interest rates start going up, what's going to happen to the price of my bonds? Go back down. Right? These are wonderfully nice things to notice, right? And it's simple because this relationship is just as exact as it could be. This is one of the few plot spots where it's a direct relationship, right? And again, you have a little bit of leeway if you, you know, if and when you guys get your high-paying, you know, fancy seventy to eighty thousand dollar a year job, you're going to start investing in a four hundred one k. 
you're going to have to decide where should I put some of that money. Under your mattress. <laughs> Don't put it under your mattress, yeah. invest it in the market, and you'll have an option to potentially put some of it in the bond market, right? If interest rates are really low, don't. If interest rates have gone back up in the in a, in a, in, a lot, in the next couple of years before you finish, yeah, maybe you will. Okay, but these are sorts of things that you should know coming out of a standard economic class. All right, so so so, so your guys' response is great. I now know the relationship between the money supply and at least interest rates. But that's interest rates. I haven't talked about GDP yet. No, yeah, we've talked about a couple chapters back. Well, how do we get back to that? <laughs> how does lowering interest <coughs> rates help GDP? Because that's what we really care about, right? I mean, this is what we want is the the economy to grow again, right? How does it work? Yep. Imagine, again, if you and, and this is going to happen to all of you in a couple of years, you guys all start your own business. Right? Start your own business. What does it cost? What do you got to do to start a business? Spend money. You got to have money, right? If you have money, you're going to have to borrow it. When you borrow money, what do you got to do? Pay interest. If interest rates are really low, you're going to borrow a lot of it. You're going to borrow more and you're going to start bigger, right? So a lot of the problems that the economy was potentially having prior to the 2009 and later times was that interest rates were in a relatively high spot and so people were not starting their own businesses because it cost too much to borrow money. When the economy tanked, in order to get people to start businesses again, what was the Fed trying to do? Shrink drop the money rates. supply. Yep. Get those interest rates to drop so they pumped money into the system. They were buying treasury securities left and right, increasing the money supply as much as they could so that interest rates would go down and business investment will increase with lower interest rates. In addition, when interest rates are nice and low, and our car is starting to get kind of old, what do we do? Potentially buy a new one. Potentially buy a new one, because we want to buy it before interest rates go up again, right? We want to buy our car at 1% interest over five years, because if we maybe wait another two years, what might interest rates do? Go up. Creep back up to three, four, five percent, right? I mean, the car dealers right now are giving us sweet deals to buy cars because the Fed has lowered interest rates down to almost zero. So those car companies are like, sweet, we can go borrow the money from a bank for almost nothing. So we can lend it to you for nothing as long as you Again, spurring consumer spending. Consumer spending on what I call large ticket items. <clears throat> you don't think that's how it works? Lower interest rates makes us spend money, folks. Now maybe not, again, some of us who are living paycheck to paycheck, lower interest rates don't make much of a difference to us, right? Again, it's those people who already have the $150,000 a year job who are looking at it going, sweet Georgia Brown, yeah, I guess I can buy another Hummer. Right? <laughs> no, why not? Just finance it too, because come on, I'm not going to pay any hardly any interest on it at all. Go ahead. All right? What are both of these? Think chapter 15. Non-price determinants of what? GDP. What's the other side of GDP? Chapter 15, what did we talk about? 
Review, never a bad thing. Fiscal policy, what were we moving? Supply. Aggregate demand. Aggregate demand, right? <laughs> These are both non-price determinants of aggregate demand. So when, e when these things increase, what happens to aggregate demand? Increases. Sweet. So AD increases. And what do we get as a result of increasing aggregate demand? Lower prices. <laughs> Higher GDP. Higher GDP. Follows. Right? So the whole point of the Fed increasing the money supply is that, it's again, it's not that they're throwing money at us so that we'll spend it. That's not what they're doing, right? What the Fed is doing is buying up treasury securities from banks so that interest rates will go down. Because when banks have a whole lot of money to lend, they'll lower interest rates to lend it. Once those interest rates fall, we react. Consumers and businesses will spend more. We will invest more because money is cheap. Interest rates are cheap. This will increase our aggregate demand because in order for a business to expand, eventually what do they got to do? Spend money. They got to spend money and it means that they got to hire people eventually. Again, it'll take a while, but it'll happen, right? And in addition, the more they hire, the more people will have to spend. Hence, that whole aggregate demand grows. We get a spending multiplier. Aggregate demand grows even more. Economy recovers. The flow begins to boil. So this, this, folks, this is the Keynesian argument. All right? And this is the answer that I will expect for you, for, from you when I ask, why does increasing the money supply increase the economy or increase GDP? Right? The non-economist response is, well, if the Fed's increasing the money supply, there's more money, therefore people buy more stuff, therefore GDP grows up. Don't be that person. Say, ooh, when the Fed increases the money supply, interest rates lower, and it's lower interest rates that spur us to spend more money, okay? I don't think the spark really is in the business sector of it. I mean, oh yeah, of course, right? But it has to come from those lower interest rates. There's not as big a change to the consumer spending. Yeah, not, no, hardly any. Really. Yeah, I mean, it's really hardly any change at all there. It's usually the businesses that either expand or start or you know whatever it is. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. this is way bigger than that. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, right. really, really but that's what pushes it eventually, right? Is this whole increasing of investment on the business side that will lead to our GDP finally growing again. And now realize that that this sort of gives us the two ways that the macro economy can fix itself, right? Or get fixed, right? One way is for the Fed to say, increase the money supply to lower interest rates to get people to spend more, right? The other way is the Chapter 15 method, the fiscal policy method, where instead of having the Fed increase the money supply, what does the government do instead? Chapter 15, quick review. What is fiscal policy? <laughs> exactly. So, what does the government do in order to increase the? Throw so a bunch of money into the. They just the spend, whole, right? The whole flow. They throw money into the flow so that it starts to turn around, and that the that this will increase aggregate demand. Remember what one of the other non-price determinants of aggregate demand is? Government spending. Because what's the formula for GDP? Plus 
<laughs> so, fiscal policy is the government stepping in and just spending, right? I mean, spend our way out of a recession. If the government buys enough stuff, eventually there will be enough people getting hired to make new stuff that the economy turns itself around. The Fed way of doing it, which is what we've been doing for the last four or five years, right? Because the government has not spent more than, you know, they've increased their spending by maybe a couple billion dollars, but not by trillions like they did in 2008, 2009. From 2009 to this year, government spending has been relatively flat. All right? In fact, actually, it's, it's dropped, right? Yeah, and they're wanting it to drop even more. They're wanting it to drop even more. But if G is falling, what's happening to GDP? It'll go it's got to too. Too. be falling too, unless everything else is going. Yeah. yeah, unless all those other things are making up for it. So what's the Fed been trying to do the last four years? They've been fighting Congress. Congress has been saying, let's reduce government spending. The well, Fed's saying, whoa, hang on, <laughs> wait a second. If the government lowers spending, we're going to see GDP drop. We need to counterbalance that, so we're going to keep pushing the interest rates lower and lower, increasing the money supply more and more, so that this will make up for that falling. That's the hope, right? And it's sort of worked, right? Doesn't the government end up borrowing the money from the Fed too to spend? Sure, but the government's not spending, right? in theory. No, but what I'm saying is, wouldn't wouldn't that be on the monetary policy side? No. Anybody can borrow from the Fed, right? Anybody can, when the Fed, remember when the Fed, when the Fed increases the money supply, who, who, who they're buying securities from, doesn't matter. What I'm saying is it make them happy because it would lower interest rates as well, right? Oh yeah, sure. Oh, it lowers interest rates for the U.S. government too, right? Because they're just throwing money away into that. Sure, you sure. Know, so increasing money supply, lowering interest rates. You would think so. Isn't it a, more of a twofold? Well, it could be. It could be. Thing right there. I mean, well, it would be if the government would spend just more spend more money, but the government has not been right. They've elected to that. Right. That's right. They, they want to balance the budget. Isn't that why it's been such a slow recovery? Yes. Yes. Right. And why would the government want us to have a slow recovery? So interest rates go down. I don't, I don't well, know. Why, why is the government, why is Congress right now not letting the government go deeper into debt? So they can raise the interest rate. Well, I mean, but again, government spending has nothing to do with interest rates, right? Only the Fed can muck with interest rates. Mm -hmm. The government, why is the government wanting to not have the economy recover? Borrow more. Well, who's the president? What, what political party is he in? The Congress, House, is controlled by which party? The Republicans. Why does Congress not want the economy to recover? Because then they can say, what a bad president that Democrat Exactly, won. because of in politics. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with economics. Because if they were really working with economics, Congress would spend more. They would say, fix the, problem. fix the problem, right? But they don't want it to be fixed because if it was fixed, then what would the president look like? A good well, it would look like a perfect state. Democrat. Yeah, exactly. We don't want that. Come on. So you have to, you know, adjust accordingly. Again, this is, you know, this is a little bit of my own conspiracy theory coming out of me in this particular instance. But if you think about it from the basic economics that we have right now, by reducing government spending, we are essentially trying to decrease aggregate demand and lower GDP. That's what our Congress is voting for right so now. So that Obama won't get re-elected? Well, no, no, so, no so that we can balance the budget. No, because if right. we don't balance the budget, what do we have to do again? What did all the Republicans say? Paul Ryan and all that. Yeah, he said we would have to sell our children yeah, to China, yeah. right? Right? Because we owe them so much money, the only way we'll be able to pay them back is if we you know, auction our children off to them at the highest price. Because they're not paying the bank for 30 them. years. I mean, can I sell my children to somewhere else? So. You can sell your child to someone else, I suppose. Right. But again, though, that's, that's, their, that's their talk, right? 
Um, the proper response, if you want, just in, you know, just for kicks and giggles, folks, if you want to have the proper response for why the government shouldn't go into any more debt, right? The reason the government should quit going into debt is because of that whole crowding out effect, right? Because when the government borrows money, they have to pay interest, right? And it's really affecting this number. If the government borrows too much money and people get scared to borrow money from the U.S., what happens to interest rates? They go up. They go up. And can the Fed fight that anymore? Not really. No, not really, right? And that's a good, valid, conservative argument for why we need to have lower debt, is that we're afraid that that may push interest rates up because of the crowding out effect that people will be worried about borrowing our money and they will need to get higher interest rates in order to do it, to lend it to us. That's a great argument, right? When you hear a conservative Republican talking about that, you should cheer them because that's good economics, right? When they start talking about selling children and we'll never be able to pay it off and all that other crap. Well, it's like I asked you about the trade thing earlier. I was mm -hmm. listening on NPR, like a good Wisconsin, or WP. Good boy. And, um, Pledge bank week. They were, they were yeah, they're, the they're, they're talking about, <laughs> I don't know what show it was, it wasn't uh, one of the regular people on there, they were talking about the, uh, the world trade affecting the ah. way the economy is affected and so on and so on, how, how people are going to lose confidence in borrowing money from the U.S. to develop their countries right. because we are not spending money. So they're saying, you know, and I don't Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting argument for why this number is going to get worse for us. And that it could lead to the same type of a problem we have with interest rates. Right. right, they just want to exploit the rest of the world like they have us. Right. That argument for me was, I could see it, but at the same time I was like, well, from a traditional economics perspective, that's... Well, when you go back and you think about, like, um, like when Enron was going to uh, build big power energy companies in India, right. for instance. Right. Okay, we're going to spend lots and lots of money building this stuff and we're going to sell cheap energy and blah, blah, blah. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the government said, oh, wait, so, you know, we're not going to spend any more money on whatever it was. Right. And so. The power plants never even got finished being built. Yeah, but they lent the whole ton of money to Enron, who then all everybody sort of went, Yoink. Yeah, well, they all <laughs> took off with the money. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Enron is so, yeah, I mean, the banks had lots of money, lent it to them at real low interest. They said, okay, we're going to go into this, and then they never did, and ran off with the money. Yeah, it's a little depressing. I agree. Um, so, this is enough for today. I don't want to get through all of chapter 20 until next week, so let's have a weekend off. No homework. Catch up on any homework that you haven't done. Uh, we haven't quite made it through all of chapter 20. The last half of chapter 20 talks about the comparison of the three different economists that we are that we have learned about. Okay? So we will next week go into completing chapter 20, taking it past this where we compare the different economists and how they argue how we should fix the economy from each person's perspective. So, have a break from homework this weekend, and we will start up again next week.